जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारे जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारे कोपे जानवाला गिरीवर दे कोपे जानवाला गिरीवर दे यशरनंदन ब्रजजानरंजन यशरनंदन ब्रजजानरंजन यमुना तेरा वनचारे यमुना तेरा वनचारे जय राधा माता कुंज बिहारे जय ओम विष्णुपाद परमहंस परिवार गुच्छाय अष्टोत्तर शतशी श्रीमद् सुवाइन ग्रेस एसी भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी श्री प्रभुपाद की जय ग्रंथराज श्रीमद् बागवतम की जय ऑल ग्लोरीस टू द सम ऑफ द वर्टीज all glories to the sum of devotees all glories to the sum of devotees all glories to shri guru and shri guranga <laughs> om namo bhagavate vasudevaya om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Okay so this morning we are reading from Shrimad Bhagavatam fourth canto entitled creation of the fourth order chapter 17 Maharaj Prithu becomes angry at the earth um text 15 Tam anvadavat tadvanya Kupitat yarunshanaha Shanam dunnushi sandaya Yatra yatra palayate Tam anvadavat tadvanya Kupito yoru nekshana ha. Sharam danushi sandaya. Yatra yatya palayate. Tamanvada 
We like to chant? No? Alright. Okay, what would be translation? Tom, um, the cow-shaped earth. earth. Anvadavat, he, he chased. Tat, Tat. then, Vainyaha, the son of King Vena. Kupitaha, being very much angry. Ati Aruna, very red. Ikshanaha, his eyes. Shadam, an arrow. Danushi, on the bow. Sandaya, placing. Yatra, yatra, wherever. Palayate, she flees. She flees. She flees. Okay. Translation. Seeing this, Maharaj Pritu became very angry and his eyes became as red as the early morning sun. Placing an arrow on his bow, he chased the cow-shaped earth wherever she would run. The cow-shaped earth ran here and there in outer space between the heavenly planets and the earth, and wherever she ran, the king chased her with his bow and arrows. Just as a man cannot escape the cruel hands of death, the cow-shaped earth cannot escape the hands <coughs> of the son of Vena. At length, the earth, fearful, her heart aggrieved, turned back in helplessness. Addressing the great opulent king, addressing the great opulent king Prithu as the knower of religious principles and shelter of the surrendered, she said, "Please save me. You are the protector of all living entities. Now you are situated as the king of this planet." Purport. Cow-shaped earth addressed King Prithu as Dharma Gya, which m refers to one who knows the principles of religion. The principles of religion dictate that a woman, a cow, a child, a Brahmin, and an old man must be given all protection by the king or anyone else. Consequently, Mother Earth took the shape of a cow. She was also a woman. Thus she appealed to the king as one who knows the principles of religion. Religious principles also dictate that one is not to be killed if he, is, if he surrenders. She reminded King Prithu that not only was he an incarnation of God, but he was situated as the king of the earth as well. Therefore, his duty was to excuse her. Just looking real quick here. Okay. Om Ajnana Tivadanda Sya Gadanjana Shalakaya Chakshuran Militam Minatas My Shi Gurave Namaha Kam Kadidva Chalam Pangam Langai Take Him at Kipatamaham Vandeshi Guran Ditanam Bancha Kupadu Vishaki Basini Baby Chapatitan and Pavani Bio Vaishnavi Biramanamaha Shi Krishna Chaitan Nebravanitananda Shi Vedikadha Shivasi Guru Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So dharm, dharma gya, so knower of uh, religious principles, the principles of religion. So uh, the ca um, cow-shaped earth, she, 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 she's telling Prithimaraj that you're chasing after me and you're, you're whatever, trying to attack me or kill me or whatever, whatever he was trying to do. But, you know, you are dharma gya, you know, you're knower, you are a knower of religious principles, so therefore you shouldn't do that. Shouldn't be chasing me, trying to attack me, kill me, whatever he's trying to do. Uh, and, it's, and Prabhupada says in the purport, the last purport we read, that the principles of religion dictate that a woman, a cow, a child, a Brahmin, an old man must be given all protection by the king or anyone else. So these different 
uh, classes of people or entities, yeah, they have to be given protection <coughs> because all of them in their own way uh, display some type of weakness. A, a woman displays some type of weakness, women in general, a cow, cows, a child, Brahmins and old men, they display, a, they all have their own interesting way or their own unique way in which they display their weakness. So therefore, they have to be given protection. For example, Brahmins, they're not known to be, you know, they're not really warriors. <laughs> uh, and therefore, a Brahmin may need some help in terms of, uh, you know, somebody protecting him in terms of uh, violence, you know, somebody committing violence towards a Brahmin, so a Brahmin may need help with that. They may need a Chatriya to, you know, if somebody's attacking, they may need a Chatriya to, you know, protect, because they just don't have that in them, really, that warrior propensity and um, maybe th not even the ability to, do, to protect themselves in that way. Just like sometimes we got on Harinam, or when we go on Harinam, devotees, you know, there's certain devotees who are kind of eager to protect the other devotees, you know, and usually they're more, whatever, kind of bigger, you know, devotees built to have some strength and may have a bit of a chatriya spirit, you know, protecting the devotees. But it's not like all devotees are like that. I mean, some devotees aren't like that. They want to avoid that, and therefore there's those other devotees protecting, you know, the Harinam party. And a child... A uh, child, I mean, so, so uh, helpless, practically speaking, children. I mean, absolutely helpless. I mean, they can't cook for themselves. They can't, they can't do anything practically besides just smile and whatever. Say, you know, of course they could talk with their parents and people and this and that. But practically speaking, in the realm of taking care of themselves, they just can't do it. And uh, and therefore, children need to be protected <coughs> for obvious reasons. And old men, I mean, old men are, yeah, they become they be physically weak. They may develop some uh, diseases, so on, in which it becomes difficult for them to to operate, to uh, fend for themselves. Just like I heard in Tucson recently at the Rathiacha, there was one devotee there. I forgot his name. Uh, he's really tall. Um, anyways, I forgot his name. But he lives there in Tucson. Sean? Sean, he's tall too, but the other one. There's two tall ones, huh? Yeah, I think it's Atul what? Atul Govinda, yeah. So he was talking to my spiritual master, and he was trying to get an interview f because they, they're developing a project there in Tucson near the temple. And the project is that they're going to house uh, senior devotees, I mean elderly devotees, senior devotees have been around for a while, and who can't really take care of themselves so much. Not really like a hospice, you know, n not that they're so close to, to, to death, but more like a senior living facility. So, house 10 people. So, so yeah, that may be... Uh, that 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 is clearly needed, you know. That is so many things are needed. <laughs> so, so protect the el elderly people, the Brahmins, the children, cows. Um, cows are also, I mean, helpless. Of course, there's a there's a you know a human. You know, a human comes and they could whatever kill a cow or you know kill so many cows. So quite helpless. They can't protect themselves. Um. So, so many of these, uh, in their own way, these different uh, different entities need protection. Women, I mean, Prabhupada said in the Science of Civilization, he said he was criticizing the women's liberation movement, which was really big back in the 60s and 70s. And I mean, I don't exactly know how it's doing now. Women's is is there considered to be? They do they call do they call they don't call it the women's. Li yeah. Yeah. So Prabhupada said, what is this woman's liberation? 
He said you, um, women's liberation means there's no man protecting them, and then any man comes, exploits them, means takes advantage of them, manipulates them. I love you, and you're, you're, you're the whatever. The guy's just lying. You know, he's completely full of it. Oh, I love you, and you're the, I'm trying to think of the other cheesy lines. Uh, yeah, you're the apple of my eye and all this other stuff, and I'll do anything for you. And then he exploits and manipulates her, and then there's some babies there. There's a baby there or some babies there, and then the guy just leaves. And then Prabhupada says, what is this woman's liberation? And then the woman, she becomes her freedom that she's so after, become, she, becomes a, she becomes dependent on what? The government, namely welfare, right? Government, please, you know, please give me, uh, please help me out because the guy's gone. And sometimes, you know, guys, it's not that, Every single one of them, you know, pays child support. Sometimes they just take off. You know, they leave the state. They go here. They, they go there. And sometimes, you know, the debt just... Ri it's not that every single one pays child support. So, so the woman needs some help, you know, practically speaking. I mean, it's hard to take care of a kid and make money and all that at the same time, most of the time. So, Prabhupada said, what is this liberation? And, uh, yeah, and that's exactly what happens. I mean, some people may disagree with this, but that is ex exactly what happens. I mean, it's just, it happens all the time. I mean, it's, it's n um, somebody was just telling me the other day, anyways, I didn't necessarily want to hear this, but anyways, I hear so many things. Sometimes I don't necessarily want to hear, but, but whatever, some devotee, uh, lady, she was telling me, a girl lady, she was telling me that, whatever, some man, oh, I, I love you, and this and that, and, Mary, and then, yeah, the guy just, like, took off, you know, so. And I was just thinking about, when, after I heard that, I was thinking about, that's exactly what Prabhupada said, he said that, said that, uh, he would say so many times, you know, but he said when, when, when women or girls are young, it's the fathers taking care of them, and then, you know, they get married, and then the husband takes care of them, and then, and then, uh, when the husband leaves and takes sannyasa and the elderly son takes care of them, sons. So this protection uh, needs to be there, else there's manipulation, there's cheating, there's lying, and then uh, in the name of, in the name of uh, whatever, this name, that name, so many horrible things go on actually. Um, yeah, so, and if, you know, people actually follow more of a traditional approach, then it's not that a woman's there and just, you know, some man comes and manipulates them, and then another man comes and manipulates and then it goes on and on and on and on, and on, and on like that, like over and over and over again. But if they were just, you know, protected and just, you know, married or whatever it is, then they wouldn't be there. Why? Because the nature is, according to uh, Bhagavatam and other sources, and just you know, we, common sense, is that these e entities display their own weaknesses, as we we're discussing. So now we're discussing women. So women also they display their own weakness, is, um, and therefore, by nature's law, there's a man in the picture strong man to, you know, protect and, right, from the outside sources. And that's, that's, that's good. That's nature's law. So, uh, I was just thinking in relation to all these women and cow and Brahmins and so, oh, so on. Uh, Prabhupada was in Los Angeles. I actually heard it, because I've heard devotees say it, but I actually never heard Prabhupada say it, but I actually heard it in a talk recently. I was listening to a talk show Prabhupada in Los Angeles. You're hungry? You can pass pass them out. We'll snap like the beans. Uh, I was I was I was listening to a talk by Sridhar Prabhupada that he gave in Los Angeles recently here in San Diego. Um, so Prabhupada was given the talk, and then one man, he one one devotee. He, 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 you hear him, it's quite loud actually. He goes, 
something like shh, you know, you know, be be quiet, be quiet. It was actually quite loud. Surprise! I was like, man, this, he didn't do it in a you know qu- hushed manner. Um, and Prabhupada. Uh, interrupted the talk, or Prabhupada began to speak about this man doing that. So this man was telling a a woman to to you know be quiet, you know telling the baby to be quiet. The baby was making noise, isn't that? So then Prabhupada said, "Oh, actually, according to our Vedic system, uh, children are not punishable." And then he said, "And according to our system." Women are also not punishable. And then he said, according to our system also, uh, Brahmins are not punishable. So he said, so I guess he, he says, well, it looks like our Christian conscious movement is just comprised of a bunch of, enti- a bunch of uh, people who are just not punishable, you know. So he said, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, that was his point. Um, so this is what... Uh, Mother Earth is saying to Prithimaj that you're trying to punish me, but you shouldn't be. Uh, I'm not punishable. You know, I'm a woman. It's against the principles like that. So this is what's being indicated here. Um, so religious principles also dictate that one is not to be killed if he is if he surrenders. So we shouldn't commit violence upon people if they can't protect themselves. That's not good. Uh, so again, in their own way, women, children, cows, Brahmins, old men, in their own ways, and like we're discussing, they can't protect themselves in some ways. In some ways they can, but not in all ways. So therefore, uh, we should be very careful <coughs> not to commit violence towards them because it is against religious principles to commit violence to these different living beings. Uh, of course, you know, we're in America. W- you know, we weren't born in India besides him and him. There's two of us who were born in India. So the cultural climate is quite different. How people deal with people, how people treat people is quite different. I mean, <laughs> like in Australia, Bajanarayan Swami says that there's two brahmacharis and they're fighting in the car know, going on Sankirtan or something, and there were some American brahmacharis in the back. They saw these two Australians fighting, 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 fighting. And then they just stop the car. And they get out, and they actually start physically fighting each other, like wrestling or hitting, whatever they're doing, I don't know. And then they get back in the car, and everything's cool, and they just keep on going, you know. And Yeah. And then the American brahmacharis are thinking, what on earth is this? Like, this is just weird, you know. That would never happen in America. I mean, sometimes... We would fight friends and myself, but it w- I don't know. They didn't. Anyways, I think it was of a different nature. <laughs> um, so, so, the, so how things are done in certain climate, certain cultural, uh, certain places in the world is quite different. And also, I mean, we're all coming from different backgrounds. I mean, how I was brought up, how you were, br- we're all completely brought up completely different. So it presents a bit of a challenge, actually. Because we not we may not be used to uh, the certain procedures, a certain kind of behavior that uh, that I am familiar with, you may not be familiar with at all. So it's it's it presents a bit of a challenge. So therefore, we have Vaishnav etiquette. There is Vaishnav etiquette for a very good reason. That means we're supposed to ditch our old social whatever um what was it norms. yeah our o- our old social norms we're supposed to ditch and how we deal with people how we don't deal with people how w- whatever there's a whole vaishnav etiquette um and which gives us a very clear understanding and is how we can operate in such a way in a krishna conscious way um adopting the krishna conscious procedures to to deal with, you know, situations in life. Or else we're acting against religious principles. And generally that means violence. I mean, somebody, somebody, uh, 
you know, somebody sees a bug or something, right? Like, you know, and they just like stomp on it. It's like, oh my God, that's just, I, that freaks me out. I mean, now maybe so many years ago it wouldn't have, but now I just stomp on the bug. It's just, so that's clearly violence. Um, but also maybe dealing with somebody roughly, um, maybe being too critical of people, maybe not having enough tolerance and patience with people, uh, giving them some chances, you know, you, let, you give some people chances, or also unnecessarily harshly correcting them about certain things which, went, which may not really be our place. I mean, therefore there's, you know, it is not that everybody respects everybody equally. That never is the case, and that is also not the case here. So, if somebody tries to correct somebody, um, you know, they, they may not listen to that person. So what's the use? Like if, I, if, if, if Glenn doesn't respect me, for example, and, I, and, I, and if I try to correct Glenn, it's like, what's the use? He's not going to listen to what I say anyways. Glenn's yeah, Glenn's humble, he would. But <laughs> so what I'm saying is that, therefore, there are systems, you know, like, okay, hey, you got some problems with someone, then, you know, go to somebody who, can, who has some influence over that person. Because generally, maybe that person will listen to you. <laughs> that may be the case. Anyways, there's so many details. But, <clears throat> but the basic point is that we have to somehow or other ditch or get rid of our old habits, social norms, our ways of thinking, feeling, operating, speaking, and adopt the Krishna conscious ways of thinking, feeling, willing, and operating. And in this way, we are actually becoming more fine individuals and we are getting rid of our violent tendencies our violent tendencies um, and we're acting ag according to the religious principles not vice versa so this is what mother earth is saying that you shouldn't be doing this and um, and he and she's saying that it's your duty to excuse me so sometimes we have to excuse people even though we may think they're wrong, sometimes we have to excuse them um, and be tolerant and patient with people. Uh, especially women, cows, children, Brahmins, and old men. <laughs> so, all right, does anyone have any uh, comments or questions? All right, I'm going to tell you, if you don't have anything just yet, I'm going to tell you this very interesting uh, information here. I thought it was very interesting. Hmm. Let me just... Uh, I was thinking about telling you two different things. Anyways, uh, so one thing is that there's a, there's a really nice verse here. I mean, it's it's a little it's off the topic, but it's I thought it says that there's uh, I'll read it to you. It says this is from the Radha Krishna Gonadesha Deepika. It says Sunada Yamuna and Bahula are some of Sri Radharani's favorite cows. These cows give birth to calves every year. She has a favorite uh, calf named, I'm sorry, this is Twavi. Shirada also has a old female monkey called Kakichati. So she has a monkey, like a pet monkey. The name of her pet deer is Rangani, so she has a pet deer too. So she has a deer, she has a monkey, she has a favorite calves, cows, and she has a bird. The name of her pet Chakori bird is Charu Chandrika. So she has a bird, a deer, 
a monkey, so I'm not sure if you knew that. Do you know that? Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Krishna has also, yes. You want to pass the mic? I was just, just a quick thought. I was thinking about how um, the different things, different classes of people we were just mentioning, mm -hmm. not only physically should be protected, but also, um, I guess you could say subtly or emotionally also, like um, women, children, brahmanas generally um, should also be protected from, like, you could say degraded things in society or, you know, being exposed to certain things in society which can degrade the mentality, which we see nowadays a lot of, you know, all these kids playing video games and killing and this and that, violence and all these things. And so then they grow up in a distorted way. Um, like made me made me think about that. Also, uh, obviously, Brahman is, you know, should be kept psychologically pure. Yeah. Children, women also should be kept psychologically pure. So that was an interesting thing. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, children. Yeah, children especially. I think because uh, they need education, they need training, um, and they need just to not be allowed to do certain things. <laughs> I mean, if you let your child do whatever they want, um, then, then of course, no parent does that, practically speaking, because that's like you go to jail for something like that. But even but I, I I would I would suspect that a lot of parents, maybe even devotee parents, allow their children to do things that they just shouldn't allow them to do, um, because for whatever reason I don't know they want to make their child happy or this and that or. But yeah, some things are just harmful, you know, to allow children to eat whatever they want or watch whatever they want or video games or this and that. I mean, how valuable is it? There's a great danger actually. Um, so yeah, the children have to be uh, protected and uh, trained and educated. And yeah, Brahmins, um, you know, because usually when we're talking about Brahmins, we're, you know, in our mind we're thinking of adults. <laughs> uh, in many ways, Brahmins have a duty to protect themselves. Means that by their education, by their training, uh, they shouldn't fall into the same foolish mistakes as everybody else, because by definition, Brahmins are supposed to be intelligent. means they're not easily bewildered. So, uh, therefore, Prabhupada said training, you know, from age five onwards, and then if by 25 or around there, somebody wants to move on, move out of the ashram and, you know, do that, the grihastha thing, then, okay, fine. But at least they had that training. And then, Prabhupada said 25 years, <laughs> 25 years grihastha life, he says it doesn't go on forever. And then, vanaprastha. And then vanaprastha, 25 years, whatever, then, then sannyas. And he said for Brahmins, it's mandatory sannyas. Now, of course, some people, whatever, due to you know, client, uh, social convention, this or that, you know, time, place, and circumstances, they might not be. I know there's some devotees not taking sannyas for different reasons, but generally, Prabhupada would 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 speak like that. And important for us is that the 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 training that we're getting now, that whatever happens in our lives, uh, whether we move here, move there, do this, do that. Um, in our in our old elderly life, the whole point the whole point of all of this really is that before we leave this body, we're supposed to become detached. We're supposed to become detached from sense gratification, from material enjoyment, from this whole material world, completely detached, men and women, and completely attached to Krishna. That's the whole point of all this training, all this education, all these classes, chanting Hare Krishna. Everything we're doing is just coming to that point. 
of course, you know, some people think, oh, that's morbid. You guys are just preparing for death your whole life. <laughs> but that's what, what can I say? That's what's stated. That, that's the whole point to become. Like, what's the point of brahmacharya life? The point of brahmacharya life is so that, when you, that if a person does, they don't have to. But if a person does become a griha, so that they don't become a griha medi, means a materialistic household or sense enjoyer who can't control their senses and knows nothing but sense gratification and really doesn't have Krishna in the center of their lives. That's the whole point of brahmacharya. That's one of the aspects of brahmacharya training. Unless they continue to be a brahmacharya, that's another thing. So that's training. What's also another aspect of brahmacharya training is that if a person does do that, that they're able to become detached from household life and become a vanaprast or a sannyasi. So that brahmacharya training helps one do that, become a vanaprastha sannyasi, successfully detached. Um, so th those are the main, th th that's the main, you know, the main aspects or the main purposes of that training. So whether one takes sannyas or whatever, the whole point of all of this training, all of this education, is to come to that final point of detachment, whether one goes this way or that way or this way or this way, to come to the main point of that detachment. So that's important for us to note. Yes? Why is it that we genuinely, we generally see um, devotees not really going in the direction of Anurpasht? I mean... There's a few examples of it, like Dhanavir Goswami and Keshava Bharti Maharaj. Yeah. But it seems for the most part, there's no, it's not like a standard uh, procedure that devotees go through. I mean, I could be wrong, it's my limited perspective, but from like what I've experienced within ISKCON, it doesn't really seem like that's the direction it goes. They kind of stay within the Grihasta Ashram, and, but continue in their services that they're doing within ISKCON. Yeah. And so is that... Is that sufficient? Is that could that be understood as grihastas that you continue on with your services, even though you're still, you know, living a, a grihasta life in a sense? Yeah. Um, well, vanaprastha. I mean, of course, you know the definition of the traditional definition of sannyas, and the and the more recent definition of sannyas. Of course, the basic principles are the same but how it's actually done is quite different. Same with brahmacharya life. I mean, brahmacharis would never live in a city like this, traditional brahmacharis. <laughs> so how Vanaprastha is done exactly may look quite different from, actually it is completely different from what's stated in the Bhagavatam. You know, Vanaprastha is like they never cut their nails or their beard and they wear bar, all this type of stuff. So, um, so in many ways, you'd say Vanaprastha, if, if, if someone was simply to retire from making money, retire from collecting money, and then, you know, engage practically all their time in spiritual activities, uh, and in going to holy places, and the wife may be there as a Vanaprastha. So that would be considered, like, you know, a Vanaprastha stage, that you're not, you know, like a Grihast, you know, like a young grihasta, you know, working for money, you know, but family, 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 family. But there's, there's more of an element of more direct Krishna consciousness going on, and less, you know, material activities. You could say material activities means less activities not directly dealing with Krishna consciousness. So devotees should do that. They shouldn't just keep on going, 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 and then. You know, there has to be a severe, there has to be a very um, intense program to purify our consciousness. You know, w once we become, I mean, at all stages of life, but especially when it becomes older, there has to be an intense program to purify one's consciousness. So, um, yeah, some devotees, if they just keep on going, then, I mean, like some people retire and they don't know what to do with themselves, you know. They just get another job. It's like, hey, well, you know, there's a lot of service here at the temple. There's a lot of, like, preaching. You know, there's a lot of things to do. You don't have to get another job. It's like, but, you know, it's they're just used to it. So it's like, I mean, it's quite interesting, actually. Work your whole life. You're able to retire, and you just get another job. <laughs> Anyways, I don't, I don't want to. 
So, um, yeah, there has to be some form of vanaprastha. And not everybody's going to take sannyas, you know, it's, it's especially nowadays and this age, it's not exactly so easy to maintain sannyas, and not everybody's going to do it. But for people who can do it, they should do it. And people who can't do it, they shouldn't do it. <laughs> so it's it's a matter we should figure out. You know, devotees should be honest and, you know, know, can I do this, can I not do this? Um, but whatever the case is, yeah, there has to be, for all grihastas, there has to be some form of vanaprastha life. Um, and for some, yes, and yes, but, so, yeah. All right. Does anyone have any last uh, question or comment? No? Okay. All right, Gantrajma Bhagavatam Ki Jai.